this is not just a book about AI. It puts the AI revolution in the context of the history of information from all the way back from the Stone Age. So it covers previous information revolutions, like the invention of writing and print and modern mass media, in order to understand what is new about this AI revolution, how AI is different from previous revolutions, and also what we can learn from the hard lessons of previous uh, information revolutions. Now, the book, of course, doesn't ignore the enormous positive potential of AI. AI can provide people with the best healthcare in history, with the best education, uh, helping us to deal with climate change, with many other problems. If there wasn't uh, so much promise in AI, people wouldn't be developing it. But, of course, there are also threats. And, you know, the entrepreneurs and the business people who lead the revolution, they speak mainly about the positive potential. So then it becomes the responsibility, the job of historians and philosophers like myself to also uh, highlight the dangers and the threats. And there are two main types of, of dangers. One type is a repeat of previous problems we saw in history with new information technology and with new technology in general. If you think, for instance, about the last big revolution, technological revolution in history, the Industrial Revolution, so if you only look at the starting point of the revolution and at the end point, you would think that everything was okay. You know, if you look at the world around 1800, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the invention of steam engines and trains and, and, and steamships and so forth, and you look at the world of, two, of the year 2000, you see that the living conditions of most people around the world improved dramatically. And this is what you would hear if you talk to experts in places like Silicon Valley. They would tell you every time there is a big technological revolution, people are frightened. But in the end, everything is okay. Look at the Industrial Revolution. However, if you look more carefully, you see that the problem is the transition period. When Industrial, revolution, industrial Technology, like steam engines and trains and telegraphs were invented, people didn't know how to build a, a good industrial society. So people experimented. And many of these experiments were disastrous. The first big experiment after the Industrial Revolution was modern imperialism. A lot of people in the first industrial nations, first Britain, then France, Germany, Japan, the United States, they argued that the only way to build an industrial society was to build an empire because industry requires raw materials and it requires markets. So a country that will industrialize without building an empire will be uh, defeated or, or pushed around by more ruthless competitors. So every country that industrialized began to build an empire, even very small countries like Belgium. And you also had these imperial clashes like between Japan and Russia over the, the, the Far East. Um, and then you had more terrible experiments in how to build industrial societies. Uh, communist totalitarianism was a huge experiment in how to build an industrial society. Fascism was a huge experiment in how to build an industrial society. And in the 1930s, 1940s, a lot of people around the world thought that the best way, or even the only way, to build an industrial society was totalitarianism. So we can say that in the end, humanity learned the hard lessons, and by the end of the 20th century, we understood imperialism is a bad idea, totalitarianism is a bad idea. But if we have to go through the same learning process with AI, 
how to build an AI-based society. And again, we experiment in imperialism, totalitarianism, world wars, who knows? The transition period is the problem. So that's one lesson from history. Uh, something that can go wrong with AI, even if the technology itself is benign, people just don't know how to use it and we need time to adapt. But there is another type of threat. AI is also different from steam engines, from telegraphs, from printing presses, from every previous technology, because this is the first technology in history that can make decisions by itself, can invent new ideas by itself, can learn and develop by itself. It is not a tool, it is an agent. An atom bomb is a tool. We decide how to use it. An AI is an agent. It can make decisions about itself and also about us. So there is an entirely new type of danger that we are facing with AI that this technology could escape our control and endanger, enslave, and perhaps even annihilate us. This is not a prophecy, it's not inevitable, but as we enter the age of AI, we need to understand we are dealing with these millions and billions of new agents we are introducing into society. And this is why I prefer to think about the acronym AI, not as artificial intelligence, but as alien intelligence, alien not in the sense of coming from outer space, alien in the sense that this is an, an, a non-organic agent that processes information, makes decisions, invents ideas in a fundamentally alien way than the organic brain of human beings. So this is a very brief introduction for what are the main threats that this technology poses what we see in much of the world is that we now have the most sophisticated information technology in history and people are uh, losing the ability to talk with each other, to hold a rational conversation. Like I'm now in San Francisco in the United States and you know, Republicans and Democrats are barely able to listen to each other and to hold a rational conversation about politics. Uh, you have many explanations about what is happening in the United States, but you see the same thing happening in Brazil, in Israel, in my home country, in France, in the Philippines. So it can't be some unique problem in US society or in the Brazilian economy. The underlying technology is destabilizing democracies all over the world. Because then democracy is a conversation and conversation is built on information technology. So most of history, large-scale democracy was simply impossible. The only examples we know of, of democracies in the ancient world are small-scale, like city-states, like ancient Athens. We have no example in Europe, in China, in India, anywhere else of a large-scale democracy before the modern age only after modern information technology appears, newspapers, telegraph, radio, television, it becomes possible to hold a conversation between millions of people spread over a vast territory. And this is when we begin to see the rise of large-scale democracies. But because democracy is built on top of information technology, if there is a major change in information technology, like we saw in the last 10 years with the rise of social media and algorithms and AIs, this creates an earthquake in democracies. It doesn't mean that democracies will necessarily collapse. Uh, we can take countermeasures, democracy can adapt. And I think Taiwan is one of the best examples we have in the world of a democracy which is able quite successfully to adapt to these new information technologies. And I think that in, in this sense, uh, not, not just me, a lot of people are saying that there is much for the Americans, for the Europeans to learn from this example. And I, I hope, and, and this again, one of the reasons I wrote Nexus is not to kind of have these prophecies of doom for the future, 
but to warn people about the dangers in the hope that we make good decisions in the present and prevent the worst case scenarios.